Hello folks, and thank you for joining me for the 26th reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. And tonight's reading is going to be a lecture that's labeled, uh, titled, An Explanation of the Third Degree Tracing Board. It's by G.R. Oswell, uh, past master of the Philanthropic Lodge, uh, number 107 in Norfolk and uh, it was delivered at the Philanthropic Lodge of Instruction on Friday 17th of February 1950 and as we get into it we'll see this uh, presentation presented by this would be a uh, the pamphlet or invitation really to the lecture uh, like a program like a program basically kind of too you know what I mean um, when we go to events today we have programs they pass out and we're going to zoom in on it real quick because I want to show you something a couple things and as you can already probably see some here we have the skull and bones right here within actually what is the pyramid it's the roof also of the tomb here within it we have the inside of a cathedral like lodge with the altar the two pillars are in there if we can zoom in a little bit more we'll see two pillars right there the altar in the middle the checkered floor we have the pentagram over here for the geometrical man value it's, it's not uh, it's not upside down it's not like a satanic reference or anything it's it's completely uh, it's a cult but it's <coughs> it's the pentagram it's not the baphomet um, excuse me for coughing there. let's see we have the maze the mallet and uh, the board here and the compass and square are in the ruler um, we have the 47th problem of Euclid demonstrated up here and of course and we have some Hebrew letters we have the compass around the edge in the west over here we have the darkness and lodge number 124 so we'll go back down 139 and an explanation of the third degree tracing board before I approach very tentatively an explanation of our third degree tracing board a few words about tracing boards in general will serve as an introduction to the subject to begin with to refer to these boards as tracing boards undoubtedly is incorrect the proper title is the lodge board and as such it is mentioned at least once in our ritual as it is practiced amongst us today those brethren who have been present at the consecration of a lodge will remember perhaps that at a certain point the consecrating officer says let the lodge board be uncovered and what we know now as the first degree tracing board is exposed to the view of that lodge for the first time and the rubric or rubric directions throughout that ceremony use the same term but as it has been the custom for so many years to use the term tracing board with reference to these painted or otherwise colored diagrams i shall refer to them by that name which is so familiar to all of us during this lecture now a true tracing board as far as masonry is concerned is just what it name implies i.e. a plain board such as is used by architects droughts draftsmen etc and our ritual refers to it as being for the master to lay lines and draw designs on the better to enable brethren to carry out on the intended structure with the regularity and propriety the ritual explanation of the first degree tracing board and in the early days of the craft such a board supported by trestles was always present in the lodge when it was open and at work
For this reason, we find it referred to in early rituals as the trestle board. I think I am right in saying that today such a one is present at every meeting of the famous Lodge of Instruction in London known as the Union's Emulation Lodge of Improvement for Master Masons. As Masonic symbolism began to develop, it is found later on with various lines drawn upon it representing, one presumes, the ground plan of Solomon's Temple, and in this latter form it is depicted on our first and third degrees tracing boards and also on the present Grand Lodge certificate. Our present day boards have not evolved from this true sense of a tracing board, but from something quite different. In the early days of the craft, Lodges has not the dignity and decorum of today. We have progressed a very long way from that period when an enterprising tavern keeper exhibited a notice bearing the words, Freemasons made here for half a crown, and when many a man was made a mason for the price of a round of drinks, the Lodges met at their own particular taverns, from which a Lodge derived its name. For instance, there was a lodge which met, which met at this motel from 1729 to 1735. In 1735, it moved to the White Lion, Grass Market, now Norfolk Street, and later on in 1785 to the Crown on Church Street. This was the first lodge to be constituted in West Norfolk and the second in the county. Practically no records survive of its life and activities. It was erased in 1786, and was known therefore as the Duke's Head Lodge. And in those days the floors of the taverns were sanded. Before the meeting commenced, the tiler would draw in the sand rough sketches of various Masonic symbols, such as the sun, moon, blazing star, etc. In due time, the sanded floors passed away, but the era of carpets or mosaic tile floors for lodges had not yet arrived. The use was made of the bare boards of the lodge room, the tiler drawing the symbols thereon with chalk or charcoal. This procedure was known as drawing the lodge, and the tiler received a special remuneration for this particular service. The amount varied within different lodges, and in old accounts I have seen the free range from half a crown to four shillings and sixpence. At the conclusion of the meeting, the initiate, or youngest apprentice, was handed a mop and a pail of water and instructed to wash out the drawn emblems. As they're erasing the uh, spells that they have just cast with those symbols. And that's, you know, who else draws symbols on the floor? Who else? Theosophy. The Satanists, or Luciferians, or uh, any type of dealing with magic, uh, incantations, uh, summonings, and various things. Um, the idea was not to enforce a menial task, but to teach him that as he obliterated the designs on the floor, so was he to exclude from his conversation with those of the outside world everything he had heard or witnessed in the lodge. It was, therefore, a symbol symbolical act inculcating in the mind of the new member the Masonic virtue of silence. Yes, must keep everything hush, hush. Drawing the lodge continued for some time. When the idea was conceived of using a sheet of canvas with the emblems painted thereon, which could easily be laid down and rolled up again and stored away at the conclusion of the lodge meeting, and as the use of these floor cloths proved a much quicker and handier method than the drawing with chalk or charcoal prior to each meeting, drawing the lodge gradually became obsolete. From the canvas which could quickly be rolled and unrolled to our present day tracing boards was but a short step. Thus it will be seen that although the true tracing board, i.e. the tracing board mentioned in the ritual, is the plain drawing board, the diagrams we call the tracing boards today had their origin in the sanded floors of the 13th, 18th century taverns. Sorry. Um, and it is well to remember here that although Grand Lodge does not oppose the presence in our lodges of the present day tracing boards, as they are anointed with certain elements at the consecration of lodges. Yet, Grand Lodge has never defined the nature of them, 
nor given any ruling that they must conform to a particular pattern. Consequently, in the early days of the present form of the tracing boards, we find a variety of designs, although the modern ones are all of conventional style. In the early and middle uh, 14th century, the masonry produced uh, three, or, or 19th century, sorry, I did that again, it's freaking Roman letters, Roman numerals of 19th century, the masonry produced three brethren for the, whose artistic ability and knowledge of the craft, symbolism, masonry as a whole, owes a deep debt of gratitude. Brother Jacobs, Browning, or Bowring, and Harris. These three brethren, all of London, were responsible for the present method of arranging and grouping the symbols on our tracing boards. It is necessary to point out that their respective designs were not identical and each one produced sets of tracing boards which differed in detail. The first two of these brethren need not concern us here for those who are interested in their work has been dealt with fully elsewhere. And it lists a, that's the book right there, AQC, Miscellanea Lat Latimorium, I guess, with the page number. It is Brother Harris who is of the interest to the members of this lodge. For this set of tracing boards is one of his designs. And as far as I know, it is the only set in the province. And naturally, philanthropic, uh, philanthropic uh, lodge prizes them great, greatly. Philanthropy, philanthropic. Uh, the fact that they are not original paintings but lithographed reproductions does not necessarily detract from their value in our estimation of their artistic and symbolic representations of the doctrines and principles outlined in the three degrees. We may also dismiss as being irrelevant the somewhat biased opinion of a well-known Masonic student and critic that the tracing boards produced by Brother Harris contain nothing of artistic merit, but were mere daubs. It would appear that Brother Harris rose to fame as a designer of tracing boards when the Emulation Lodge of Improvement adopted a set of his designs in 1846, after which he received orders for tracing boards from several other lodges. He was initiated in the Lodge of Good Intent, number 479, in 1818. Unfortunately, he became blind in 1857, and from then onwards until his death in 1873, he was a pensioner of the RMBI. It is because our tracing boards are of his design, and that this third degree tracing board differs greatly from the conventional pattern of the present day, that I have chosen it as the subject for this view evening's lecture. This set of tracing boards was presented to the lodge by Brother Cummings in 1957. Today, very little is known. Uh, that had to be 1947 because it just set up here that this was set in 1950. So that's a misprint. So I'm going to say that set, yeah, 17th February 1950. That has to be 1947, he meant. Or, you know said actually whatever and somebody misprinted here so um okay and today very little is known of rem or remembered of brother cummings according to the centenary history of philanthropic lodge he was a tailor and a draper at Fakenham, Norfolk, and was initiated in this lodge in 1855 and became its master in 1859, receiving the provincial honor of superintendent of works. Wow, in four short years. Uh, following year after that. Although apparently nothing else is known of uh, now of Brother Cummings, yet this one act of his alone of presenting the lodge with this set of tracing boards deserves our everlasting gratitude and remembrance. The other set of smaller tracing boards was given to the lodge in 1884 by Brother T. M. Wilkin through Brother Glacier, who joined the lodge in 1858 from the British Lodge No. 8 and was our master in 1860, 1861, and 1864 and was Provincial Senior Grand Warden in 1860. These smaller tracing boards, which are 
also Brother Harris's designs follow less or more the customary pattern of today. It is quite possible and highly probable, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, that the only tracing board in the possession of the philanthropic lodge prior to 1857 was the one now highly prized by us, which belonged to Philip Broadfoot, that famous mason of the first half of the 19th century, or 18th century, 19th, yeah, 19th century, who rendered such great service not only to masonry in general, but to this lodge in particular, of which he became a joining member in 1835. This tracing board deals with the subject matter of the first degree only. We have nothing to show that Philip Broadfoot possessed tracing boards of the two superior degrees. If in its early days there was present in the lodge the true tracing board of our ritual, and which is still referred to as one of the three immovable jewels of the lodge, the ritual explanation of the first degree tracing board, or if the lodge has made use of the painted canvas cloth floors which preceded the diagrammatic boards we erroneously call tracing boards today, they have long since passed away and disappeared from the memory of the lodge. I have heard no traditions concerning them. The fact that we possess the first degree tracing board only of Philip Broadfoot may cause us to agree with the theory put forward by Brother Drieg that the body of masons known as the ancients had but one tracing board which sufficed for the three degrees. Brother Dring is also of the opinion that the other body of masons, whom the ancients referred to as the moderns, had two a tracing boards. When the division into the three boards of today came about, unfortunately it is not known. We may also note here in consideration of another well-known authority on the subject, the late brother E.A.T. Breed, that tracing boards were not in general use, especially in count or country lodges before 1825. Incidentally, it is rather more than probable that although there were two other lodges in King's Lynn at that period, Union and Good Ship Fellowship, Philip Broadfoot joined Philanthropic Lodge because, having been initiated in an ancient's lodge, the influence of his early Masonic career was still manifest, and whereas, up to the time of the famous union of the moderns and the ancients in 1813, Philanthropic was an ancient's lodge, and two other two were under jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of the Moderns. Uh, Union Lodge was erased in 1836 and Good Fellowship in 1851. Uh, Having then very concisely but far from completely traced the origin and evolution of our tracing boards, we may now pass to the interpretation of the symbols portrayed on our third degree board by Brother Harris. We do not know, and it is most likely that we will ever know whether Brother Harris produced his designs to order or whether they prove his merit as a Masonic scholar and symbolist. That dramatic representation known to us as the third degree deals in allegory and symbolism with the subject of death and the life eternal which lies beyond the grave. That life eternal and all it implies is of greater import than death. This degree is shown in the closing sentence of the prayer with which the ceremony opens, wherein the hope is expressed that the candidate may rise from the tomb of transgression to shine as the stars forever and ever. Brother Cartwright has pointed out in a, on a commentary on Freemasonic ritual, his, this sentence has often been objected to by various critics as containing a nonsensical simile. But such critics have not known the VSL as well, perhaps as they might. The phrase, to shine as the stars forever and ever, is derived from the book of Daniel, and a marginal note refers to the first Corinthians. And uh, where he oh, where he speaks only at, uh, where speaks as only that great initiate Saint Paul could speak of the glory of that life which is to come. In one sense of our ritual death is a veil the eye of human reason cannot penetrate, unless assisted by that light which is from above.
which light is, of course, the VSL, but to him who is master mason in the true meaning of the term, the veil is partly drawn aside, disclosing a glimpse of life hereafter and eternal. Uh, Reverend uh, Canon W.W. Covey Crump, The Symbolic Significance of the Middle Chamber. It is not given to man to comprehend wholly the mystery of life after death, and that partial glimpse obtainable by him who has thoroughly assimilated the teachings of the three degrees is not shown on this particular board, but is symbolized on our modern tracing board by the small representation of a figure slightly drawing aside the veil which separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. We may read in another place when at a certain hour that veil was rent in twain from top to bottom. It is only by the study of the revelation contained in the VSL that the natural horror of death is partly explored, enabling darkness to become visible, permitting the truly prepared candidate a vision of the glory of that future life which is here portrayed or portrayed by the fully illuminated sanctum sanctorium. And uh, it is, in the words of one of our past honorary members, the late Reverend Canon W. W. Covey Crumb, a vision across the open grave. British Masonic Miscellany, that's where that's from. The Sanctum Sanctorum must not be confused with the middle chamber mentioned in the second degree, which is a symbol of ideas quite distinct from that which is implied by the Holy of Holies. Uh, the middle chamber is a representation of certain conceptions of our present life. The other denotes the condition beyond the worldly life. And, uh, okay, at the head or west end of the tracing board is a sprig of acacia, another symbol of resurrection and life eternal. It is placed at the head and not elsewhere because the seat of all intelligence or consciousness lies in the brain, and the brain is situated in the cranium or the skull, and it is for this reason that this particular emblem of mortality is given prominence in the third degree. It may perhaps help us to understand better what is implied by making use of the skull as a symbol. Very prominent not only in this degree, but on our tracing board, to recall that the life, teaching, and passion of a great initiate reach its culminating point at Golgotha, which we are told means the place of the skull. Um, the sublime degree follows very closely in alternate symbolism, the life and doctrines of that outstanding figurehead of Christianity. Such an interpretation of the third degree has been dealt with at length by a well-known Masonic student and writer in a most interesting work, published some years ago, which made deep impression on the craft as a whole, and has already run into several editions. The meaning of masonry, but the occasion... Oh, sorry. He keeps... In parentheses are all these references. Um, and every once in a while I accidentally keep reading right into the reference. But um, but the acacia is also a symbol of innocence, and in this respect, we may well remember those five craftsmen who worked a certain piece of ground with a sprig of acacia, or they hastened back to Jerusalem. The fact they were craftsmen, i.e. initiates, who fully understood the mystery of regeneration and the conditions of life uh, entailed thereby and that they placed the sprig of acacia in exact position to mark their discovery is an important point of the symbolism of the great allegory which constitutes this degree, which is frequently overlooked. It merits more than a cursory consideration by those who would endeavor to make a real daily advance in Masonic knowledge. The above is but a brief and incomplete sketch of all that is inferred by the central feature of our third degree tracing board, that it forms part of a subject very difficult of comprehension and is not to be denied. In words, which ought to be familiar to all of us, which yet comparatively few have heard or are even aware of, for we are too busy making masons to spare time for speculating on our royal art in the lodge, 
to a perfect knowledgeable of this degree few will attain. But it is an infallible truth that he who gains by merit those marks of preeminence and distinction which the degree affords receives a reward which amply compensates for all his attention and assiduity. Um, and it is quite possible that those words were written by Philip Broadfoot himself as a later uh, as a letter of uh, his suggests. It is a letter written when he was residing in King Lynn, King Lynn, King's Lynn, and it was a member of the Philanthropic Lodge. I possess a copy of it, and, and the original is still in existence, being in the possession of the descendants of the late brother Henry Mug Muggeridge, who was one of the preceptors of the famous Stability Lodge of Instruction founded in 1817. Around the foot of what constitutes the main feature of our tracing board are grouped three identical Hebrew letters in the form of an inverted triangle. This letter, the He, and the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet appears on other tracing boards as the figure five. What these three fives symbolize is a matter of controversy. Brother Covey Crump was one of the opinion that taken individually they stand for the signs of the degree the five P, uh, five parts of fellowship, and one of the secrets now associated with the royal arch. Now, the most ingenious theory put forth by a brother some time ago is that an old tracing board there were three symbols somewhat like the letter V, from which he deduced they referred to the position of the feet when making a certain mode of progression peculiar. Uh, uh, particular to this degree and an important part of the ceremony. Later, artists mistaking these symbols for the Roman numeral V changed them to a more familiar figure 5, and the designers of modern tracing boards continue to perpetuate this error. The general opinion, however, among the students today is that they allude to the three classes or the lodges of fellow crafts who were ordered to carry out a particular quest of which only one class proved successful. Okay, so through here, you know, uh, we've had the middle, you think of Lord of the Rings and the, the whole kingdom that is an example of the, the levels here in the middle time. Um, here you talk about the carry out a particular quest, the three groups you're talking about, like the quest for the Holy Grail, is again where that allegory, where that story is pulled out of. Um, the V, of course, <clears throat> we know what the V is, and three V's is V, 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 or Va, Va, Va. When in Hebrew letters, it would be Va, 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 although that's not the letter they have up there. But, uh, we know what V is. And 555 stands for. On the left or side, south side of the tracing board appears what is today the familiar badge of a past master. It should be rioted. Or, or what does that mean? That it is the badge. It should be noted, probably is what that's supposed to say. It should be noted that it is the badge, but not the symbol of a past master. For this is an instance where there is great difference between a badge and what it symbolizes. By those authority, it became the badge of a PM, a past master. It is one of the Masonic questions to which no answer may ever be forthcoming. The symbol itself appears in various early Masonic publications, but nowhere is it described as the badge or emblem of a past master. In the first edition of the Book of Constitutions, published in 1721, it figures on the frontispiece as that amazing proposition which is the foundation of all masonry. And at a meeting of the Grand Lodge in 1814, it was decided that a square and quadrant should be the emblem of a past master. But in the year 1815, the Book of Constitutions describes the jewel of a past master as a square and pendant within it, the diagram of the Euclidean proposition, which is the, that diagram, which is right up here on the tracing board. The copy of the tracing board will go back up here. The, oh, see this program here has the uh, tracing board 
you know, a picture of the tracing board on it here. And it's talking about this symbol right here. That's the proposition of Euclid symbol right there. And it has a triangle in the middle after the... So you can, you can look at it. If you don't know what the proposition of Euclid is, you can look it up. Let's get back down here. This is supposed to be a short reading. <laughs> Went way past myself. Sorry, folks. never went back up but anyway the first line consists okay can't believe I went that far passing okay Today, filming da, 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 da. Okay, so published in 1721, 1814, inside the square and the emblem, blah, blah, blah. And then, so, <laughs> it goes on, square and pendant. So, curiously enough, the alteration has never been questioned in the craft. Under the jurisdiction of the United Grand Lodge of England, has tactically, t tacitly, accepted this symbol as the emblem of the PM ever since. The one I just showed you. The, the Euclid with the thing in it, the pendant. And so, um, the canon Covey Crumb, the, uh, Pyth Pythagorean, uh, proposition, but, uh, but the question still arises, what does it symbolize in speculative masonry? Okay, and again, there is a divergence of opinion. We may, of course, put on one side its operative use, that it is well known outside the craft as within it. If I may refer to, once again, the late brother, Reverend Kenny Covey Crump, who undoubtedly ranked among the greatest Masonic scholars and whose opinions on Masonic interpretations are worthy of every consideration. He says that it is evidently the symbol of another symbol, and that uh, the other symbol is those certain Hebrew characters to which the attention of our ancient brethren was drawn when they went to receive their wages in the middle chamber of the temple. Those Hebrew characters, as we may see if we look carefully on the second degree tracing board, where they appear just above the door of the middle chamber were Yod, He, Vam, and He of the Hebrew. I thought there was only three letters. Okay, so Yad, He, Von, He, of the Hebrew alphabet, which consists of the name of God, which is the, the Tetragrammaton. So, okay. And about to which uh, so much has been written. It is said that this was the word spoken by the high priest once a year when he entered the Holy of Holies to make propitiation. Propitiation. Prop, I can't talk all of a sudden. Whatever, propitiation, whatever that freaking word is, for the sins of the people. And, uh, like, we need a middleman. You know, that, what do you think Jesus came for, people? Anyway, we know what the church is. It's not of Jesus, not of the real Jesus. And I digress. The letters are all of consonants. And the true vowel paintings, which would make the name pronounceable, have been lost. <clears throat> there were no vowels in Hebrew. So I don't even know what to talk about the true vowel um, uh, paintings, which would make the name pronounceable. How would there be vowel paintings? There's no vowels in Hebrew. But anyway, again, I digress. It's, these readings really mess me up because these, these guys were all just full of pomp and circumstance and big words, and they made fancy speeches like this that really don't lead you anywhere. 
around in one big giant circle around the lodge is what it is. That's why they walk in a circle. Because they're going around this fucking circle. Oh, I'm sorry for the interruption, folks. Did you think I was really a Freemason or something and went into this? Was this your first reading with me here? Sorry. Um, Alright, so I will continue now. When we consider what in Freemasonry that name can convey to us when analyzed, especially by certain methods employed by Kabbalists, it should seem that the 47th problem of Euclid symbolizes all that is meant by a full knowledge of the mysteries of the craft and that it is the key by which to obtain the genuine secrets of a Master Mason. It can only be in this sense that by some unknown authority it has become the badge or emblem of a PM, past master, who theoretically has thoroughly mastered all that the Freemasonry has to teach and applies that teaching to his daily life. The use of geometrical designs to illustrate abstract ideas is, of course, very old, as old indeed as symbolism itself. As a moment or two ago, I mentioned the Kabbalists. <laughs> Sorry, just a word concerning them is perhaps necessary, as the term may be unknown to most of you. Kabbalah is the late Hebrew word meaning received lore, and it is a name given about the 15th century to a system of Jewish theosophy and mysticism which had its origin about the first century B.C. in Alexandria, the great center of Ling Ling in the Old World, and contains a mixture of Jewish, Greek, Egyptian, and Babylonian elements. And he's very correct in all this that he's saying there. It flourished among the Jews in Spain from the 9th to the 15th century, owing to a great persecution towards the latter part of that century, there was quite an exodus of Jews from that country. They spread over the rest of Europe, including England, and their doctrines exercised more than a little fascination among the learned Christians from that time onwards. How, when, and even why Kabbalism entered Freemasonry and influenced the development of its symbolism is another of those Masonic problems which has never been solved. Many theories have been advanced, but it is readily recognized by those who have made research in that direction. None is wholly acceptable. To speak of Kabbalism and to illustrate how it permeates almost all the degrees of Freemasonry would require several lectures. And it is, therefore, quite impossible for me to speak more fully on this aspect of our ritual. There is a fairly large literature on the subject which can be commended to those who would care to study it more fully, while every student will find it not only interesting, but will help him to understand the many points of our ceremonies. Underneath the badge of a past master are six lines in a well-known Masonic cipher the invention of which is traditionally attributed to Albertus Magnus, Bishop of Cologne, and one of the great German builders of the 18th century. Who, or, oh, sorry, 13th century. See, 13, I can't read Roman numerals fast. I have to go back and look at them again. Don't know why. Who is said to be among the first to teach the principles of the most noble of all orders of architecture, the Gothic to and Gothic, the Gothic, or to his fellow craftsmen? And it was originally my intention to illustrate on a blackboard how to obtain the key to this cipher, but I am afraid the time factor will not permit, as it would make this lecture un duly prolonged. I will therefore content myself with observing that it is used in a variety of ways and in the method employed by Brother Harris, like Hebrew, it reads from right to left. The first line consists of the initials of the password leading to this degree, and it is followed by the letters HAB, or H-A-B, and the usual contradiction of the name of the leading figure in the allegory which comprises the third degree. Beneath this is the date of the great tragedy, AL3000, AL are the initials of the Latin words 
and lucis, which means year of light. The light, in this instance, being the light of creation. An interesting theory concerning this date is put forward by Brother Reverend F. D. P. Castells. In the Middle Ages, there was prevalent an opinion that the world was destined to last 6,000 years, after which there would be a millennium of universal peace and happiness. And so the year AL 3000 was, in a way, the central point in human history, which the death of the brightest character recorded in the annuals of Freemasonry at that point had the effect of dividing the 6,000 years into two equal parts. Then follow the letters of MBMB. These are the contracted forms of the secret words of the degree. There is no doubt that the first was the Master Mason's word of the moderns and the other of that of the ancients. Brother, the Reverend Dr. Rosenbaum, a well-known authority on Hebrew proper names, informs us that blank is Hebrew whilst the other is Aramaic or Aramaic and they may be said to convey the meaning attributed to them in the ritual. I am indebted to Brother Robin of Sirius Lodge, Swaffham, who is a very keen student of the Kabbalah, for the information that when dealt with by a numerical code known as Gematria, both words reduced to seven, which is, of course, the number of perfection. I do not think it is for Fortuitous, or even a coincidence, but that the compilers of each ritual deliberately chose a word to designate Master Masons which would reduce to this number, and that like many Hebrew proper names found in the VSL, they were made up. Uh, they were made up. <laughs> I was, was going to say it was made up of something else, but it just says they were made up. Period. Okay. Brother Raman has also been to considerable trouble to demonstrate to me how the words of the first and second degrees, B and J, both reduced to height uh, to eight, which according to the Kabbalah uh, symbolizes not only regeneration but equilibrium or stability. Okay. And you know what? Boaz and Jarhim or Jarkim or whatever the fuck. The two pillars. Is B and J if you don't know that already. Um, it is more than probable that, um, in common with so many lodges in our pronunciation, the first word is entirely wrong. The word, it would seem, is a quadrisyllable and not a trisyllable. One writer, at least, has pointed out that to make it a trisyllable it is as bad as calling Shalom, Shalom, or Shalom, Shalom, or whatever, back of whichever is which. And the father of David, Jess. Um, all right, exposure was uh, in the in the uh, 18th century this time. Okay, and exposure or expose was published, which ran into several editions, bearing the word as its title. There is a very reason to believe that this exposure, in common with others published around about the same period, was made use of by the brethren of those days as an aid to learn their work. And seeing the word in print, the habit arose of pronouncing it as an English word of three syllables, and this error has been committed by a large number of lodges ever since. When spoken as a quadrisyllable, the correct pronunciation is with the second syllable, syllable accented. Thus it is pronounced in this manner in most lodges in the north and west of England, as well as in the lodges of Ireland, Scotland, and the Dominions. The last two lines may be taken together. They consist of six single letters, the first three being CCC and the others FFZ and they refer to a portion of the seventh section of the first lecture. Now, how long should an EA serve entered apprentice, serve his master? Seven years. How should he serve him? With freedom, fervency, and zeal. Excellent qualities. What are their emblems? Chark, uh, chark, chalk, charcoal, and clay. And the lecture then continues with the disquisition upon the moral qualities dis symbolized by these three substances. 
on the right or north side of the tracing board is a symbol familiar to as many outside the craft as within it. The five-pointed star, known as the pentagram or pentalpha. This symbol is not mentioned in that ritual nor in the third degree lecture, and it would appear that Brother Jeremy Cross was the first to consider it as an emblem of the third degree and put it in his hieroglyphical chart, first published in 1859. It is definitely not the bright morning star alluded to in the ceremony, although it often is mistakenly referred to as such by masters of this and some other lodges. It is generally considered as the symbol of a master mason and the FP of F, when a man stands upright with his arms horizontal and his legs outstretched. He illustrates this. Like I said at the beginning of this, when I was showing you the symbols, uh, the geometrical, it's not meant to be, like you said, have anything to do with Lucifer, the bright morning star, any of that. It's simply the, uh, like, uh, I forget who drew that. But, you know, the man outstretched. And then that's the same symbol, the pentagram. The one they put on the satellite and sent to, you know, whatever, Alpha Major or Ursa Minor or whatever the hell they sent that thing a long time ago. Anyway, uh, if, however, we interpret this symbol according to Kabbalism, which, as I have already said, permeates Freemasonry, we will find that it contains within itself very concisely almost the whole of the Masonic philosophy. Let us take the pentagram in its simplest form with one point in the ascendant. When placed the other way with two points uppermost, it is considered the symbol of evil. Like I said, you turn it upside down, it turns into the Baphomet. The single point at the head represents the great spirit God. The line drawn from there to the left-hand angle at the base represents the descent of the spirit into matter in its lowest form, whence it ascends to the right angle typifying matter in its highest form, i.e. the brain of man. From here, a line is drawn across the figure to the left angle representing a man's progress in intellect and material civilization which, if not directed in the right way, constitutes a danger point from which he is liable to fall into moral corruption, signified by the descent of the line to the right angle at the base. But when the soul of a man being derived from God cannot remain at this point, but must struggle upward, as it is symbolized by the line reaching again to the apex of God, from whence it is issued. If the drawing of this line has been followed closely, it will have been seen that a pentagram has been drawn within a pentagram, and it is this latter form of the symbol that the Brother Harris has delineated on his tracing board, enclosed within the circle of eternity. Below the pentagram, continuing downwards and across the foot of the tracing board, are some of the lines of Hebrew. And we saw that. And it is a matter of conjecture whether Brother Harris was as good at his Hebrew as he was with his painting, as some of the words are doubtful. But the following may safely be taken as a good translation. And it says, The house of the holiness in Jerusalem. It was built by the hands of Solomon, king of Israel, Hiram, king of Tyre, and Hiram of Bith. Um, and, the, and the work uh, was completed in the year 3000. And at the foot of the tracing board are the weapons made use of by the three ruffians mentioned in the ritual. And that's the, the one for Hiram Abiff, where they went through each gate and, you know, one killed him with the rule, one killed him with the square, and the other one hit him with the, with the mallet. And uh, in the evening, in the... No, oh, sorry. And the events concerning their use are familiar to you all. There are to be seen also the WTs of the degree lying on the true chasing board. One of the one depicted here symbolizes our individual selves in this life and the lines drawn upon it, the plan of our own lives, which ought to be carried out according to the Masonic line and rule, which are a while the WTs remind us to perform our allotted task as Master Masons while it is yet day. A word may now be said concerning the position. And then that was a big thing back then, before electricity. The whole day thing, clear back into history. I mean, if you're talking even in religion, um, on through the Middle Ages and beyond, uh, that was the biggest fear of the, of the ancient world, was the dark. 
um, you can see that throughout history, religions built up around the sun and, and the sun's cycles um, because of this reason. They feared the dark for many different reasons, of course, as we know. A word may now be said concerning the position of the tracing board in our lodges. That it should be laid on the floor in the center of the lodge is a point on which all authorities are agreed. As the tracing board has taken the place of those emblems which were once drawn upon the bare floor boards of the lodge room, it is but logical that this is the proper place for it to be displayed. Propping it up against the pedestal of the JW or the secretary's desk, a procedure found in so many lodges today where it can be seen by a section of the brethren only, is a modern innovation which has nothing to commend. Hold on. Oh my gosh. Uh, hold on. Let me see if I, I got to pause for a second. Hold on. All right, folks, I apologize for that. Um, had one cat jumping on another one there for a minute. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, procedure found in so many lodges today, you know, where we were, where the tracing boards would be found in the philant philanthropic lodge is, of course, an impossible position, has not one single point of tradition behind it, and leaves one wondering, somewhat vaguely, where they were placed when the lodge met elsewhere. We have now surveyed, very briefly, the origin of our tracing board and the interpretation of the third degree shown in the arrangement of the symbols as originally painted by Brother Harris. That this third degree tracing board is more interesting than its modern successors, I think you will all agree as many points arising from Freemasonry as outlined in the three degrees which Brother Harris has symbolized are missing from the third degree tracing boards of today. The value to us of summarizing fundamental principles by symbols cannot be expressed better than in the words of one of the most brilliant scholars and writers Freemasonry has yet produced. The place of symbols, and I, this is a quote, the place of symbols in the scheme of signifying things is rather like that of church sacraments, as if apart from the rest. They are of institution, so to speak, and are of things of artifice. In the triangle, the cross, and the pentagram, the so-called star or shield of Solomon, are old portents indicating secret things. Behind their Masonic meanings, meanings are others of a deeper kind, and they can be read and understood in that light. The word within the word, the message at the back of the symbol, the second sense of allegory. It is in the finding of these that we shall enter into the secret kingdom of rites behind the rites, and into a living masonry of which this at work among us is a vestige and a shadow. End quote. And that's by weight, a -E, weight. And out of emblematic Freemasonry and the evolution of its deeper issues. And then here's the appendix. The following is an exact copy with all faults of the original photograph letter found among the papers of the late Henry Muggeridge. And the original letter is still in the possession of the descendants of Henry Muggeridge and was obviously addressed to him in reply to request for some explanation of the origin of our ritual. It is dated the year following the death of P. Thompson, for many years co-leader in the Philip, with Philip Broadfoot of the famous Stability Lodge of Instruction. And since 1835 to his death, in sole leadership, when Henry Muggeridge assumed the leadership by general consent. The explanation given therein refers to facts 35 years old. Stability Lodge of Instruction having been founded in 1817. And this is Lynn Norfolk, September 1st in 1852. Dear Sir and Brother, I have to acknowledge your esteemed favor of the July 1st, also yours of the 27th of August, and having to apologize for my delay in answering. I feel greatly obliged by your kind communication in furnishing me with all the particulars relating to the Lodge of Instructions during the last two years. My venerable friend and brother Thompson occasionally, but more particularly at the end of each session, when he usually furnished me with the occurrences that took place during the year, I shall be happy to hear from you at any time, but more particularly at the end of each session, as I take great interest in the prosperity of the Lodge of Instructions. The first degree was arranged by Dr. Hemmings, and I waited several years in the hopes that he would 
as he had promised, arranged the second and third degrees. But it was put off from time to time, until at last his mind became enfeebled, and he was incapable of doing anything in the matter. I therefore consulted my brother Thompson, and stated my intention to undertake the task myself, and having the first degree as a moral viz, introductions, sections, clauses, and moral at the end of each section, I proceeded on that principle, and although I claim no credit for originality, yet the task was not an easy one. To find matter for the introduction to the degrees, the moral, etc., etc., in fact it was a task such as I had never before had in hand, and it is certain that I shall never be able to do anything of the kind again. I hope to be in London in October, but at present it is very uncertain whether I shall be able to remain longer than one day, and I, then will I be engaged on a business which takes me up. If I have time to remain, I will do myself the honor of waiting on you. At all events, I will call on you the first time I come to London, after the time before I mention should I be unable to see you then. Give my fraternal regard to the brethren to whom I am known, and in fact to who all who form the lodge of instruction. I remain, dear sir and brother, yours fraternally, uh, Philip Broadfoot, and um, as stated in the centenary history of Philanthropic Lodge, Philip Broadfoot died at King's Lynn on 14th August 1858 and was buried in the local cemetery. A headstone was erected over his grave on which depicted the jewels of a master mason and worshipful master of the craft degrees, erred of a companion, and past Zerubbabel of the a royal arts degree. And among the obituary notices in the Lynn Advertiser of the 21st of August 1815 is the following. Well, we don't need to read this obituary. Um, and that is the end of this reading. And I'm going to real quick before we totally take off here. It's, it's been this did not go as smoothly as I had planned when I started, but you know a lot of times they don't. This is uh, not your average art form here. So here's the uh, the copy picture photograph of the uh, the board. Okay, and I thought I thought at first when I first started this, I thought it was actually a piece of paper with the picture on it. I thought it was like a program or an invitation, but I see now it's actually this is uh, basically a rug, or it's you know it's, it's it's printed on on a on like they was talking about what they went to where they can unroll it and roll it back up, and it's spread out on a floor, so or on a wall to take this picture. Maybe it was hanging on a wall and take this picture because it's got a, obviously got a frame around it and everything. But uh, so here we have the look, and then he's, you know, <clears throat> of course this is a grainy, hard to see picture and stuff. And you have all the elements that he was talking about in here, the three weapons, and the board here, their own original tracing boards from the what would be the first, second degree, I guess. And then there's symbols in the picture right here. If you look closely, you have a man. We're going to get it. This is an extended version here. Okay, so right up here you have what could be a bird or something. Looks like maybe wings here. Or something I can't really make that out but what I can make out here is I can make out this silhouette of a man right here that's slightly lit or light lighted okay which is being overshadowed by this dark figure here okay with the two horns you can see the two horns it looks like a giant bat actually who's getting ready to to envelop this dude here and Again, this is just what I'm seeing within this picture. I, uh, and then, of course, the skull and bones. We all know about skull and bones there in the, uh, in the tomb, etc. And then all the Hebrew writing and what we just went over. So here's the symbols that you're talking about. And with that, I thank you for joining me. And we'll end this now. And join me for my next reading coming up soon.